Hey, podcast listeners, I'm Barbara Morgan, and you're listening to Austin Film Festival's On Story podcast. This week on On Story, we're joined by The Humans writer and director, Stephen Karam, for a conversation on adapting his play for the big screen. Stephen Karam is a playwright, screenwriter, and director. His plays, Sons of the Prophet, a comedy drama about a Lebanese-American family, and the subject of today's episode, The Humans, were finalists for the Pulitzer Prize for Drama in 2012 and 2016, respectively. The Humans won the 2016 Tony Award for Best Play, leading to Karam adapting the play for the big screen in 2021. The film was shown at the Austin Film Festival. Set inside a pre-war duplex in downtown Manhattan, The Humans follows the course of an evening in which the Blake family gathers to celebrate Thanksgiving. As darkness falls outside the crumbling building, mysterious things start to go bump in the night, and family tensions reach a boiling point. Moderator Casey Barron sat down with Stephen Carham for a panel about his work at the Austin Film Festival. Clips of The Humans, courtesy of A24. So, Stephen, I guess just starting with... The genesis of the play, where did the impetus to create that story and take it out to the world uh, really start from? I will say I do remember specifically thinking about um, my own anxiety and fear and the things that were keeping me up at night. And I started to think about the questions I can't answer, the problems I can't solve in my own head, and how to maybe think about turning those into uh, stories or art. I started to think about my love of uh, scary movies and the thriller genre and psychological thrillers and psychological horror. And I'd never written a genre piece before, but basically I thought the play was going to be pretty camp and a bit more running towards blood and gore. And I thought about, you know, processing maybe the fears of a family through through, through a story that might actually elicit the kind of scares or anxiety I was feeling. I was like, that might be really fun. Um, So that was the earliest origin story. And then, uh, I hope it's not too much of a spoiler alert, it did sort of become uh, both the play and, you know, I'm sure we'll talk about the film, but it's like it, it eventually became something that was much more, I would say the DNA of it became very fused to the point where uh, even when I was trying to make it more of a, a really specific um, jump scare of a play, going back to like Death Trap or something that was on Broadway, a kind of thing you don't see so often, it just kept coming back to the psychology of these people and my interest in them, my love for them. Why didn't we ask the landlord to replace all the light bulbs before we moved in? Because that's a crazy thing to ask for, babe. No one asked for it. No, they probably all Yeah, no one legs. asked for it. And even if they did... It wouldn't matter because... (laughs) What are you laughing at? (laughs) She's burning out the bulbs to get our attention. What? What, Who is? She with no face. (sighs) She strikes again. Now you got her started. (laughs) What's so funny? What? (laughs) Dad sees faceless woman in his sleep. Ooh. (laughs) You're a crazy person. (laughs) Where are you going, crazy lady? (laughs) To the bathroom. It's going to be like spelunking just to go pee. Uh And I found that genre doesn't really like that kind of complexity too much, or it doesn't necessarily demand it from from those kinds of haunted house plays. So long story short, I, I stopped thinking about it in terms of what I was doing and just tried to keep doing what was what I was doing that felt like very organic and honest, which was uh, both a family drama and something more genre. And so I, in my head, I was thinking of, of writing a, a family thriller. And then, you know, you listen to what other people actually experience, and, and yeah, you get a lot of different answers, I think. It's one of my favorite pieces of, or parts of the film, because it was so unexpected for me personally. Um, I'm curious where some of that love and some of that passion originates for from you. What were some of those earlier pieces, like A Death Trap, that really spoke to that? So I grew up in Scranton, Pennsylvania. In Scranton, I would say like my library had a very limited drama section, but it had a drama section. And so the things I did discover were like, I remember discovering Sleuth and Death Trap, which were very popular, uh, commercial plays on Broadway back in the day. And you know, if you guys have this experience as like making your own movies or writing your own stuff, that the, that feeling of like discovering a thing when you're young that you didn't even know existed. 
So I'd say that's the earliest sort of awareness of it. And then there wasn't an art house in my neighborhood, so I wasn't seeing, you know, early Polanski or the sort of um, some of the scary movies that were more visually maybe influential in the way I thought about the genre as time went on. But, you know, even movies like like when Wes Craven, you know, rebooted himself in the, the with the Scream franchise, I'm, I'm not embarrassed to say that was kind of my introduction to, I got a very late introduction to cinema. My path to being a cinephile was, was not like, and at eight years old, I was being led to the cinema. It was much more like, uh, my curiosity stemmed from seeing that movie. And I was like, what other movies are really scary? And, you know, my AOL dial up with the ringtone, like, you know, gathering information in ways that now probably seem comical to, to anyone younger. Cause you would just go online and be like, here's the 20 movies you need to see if you like uh, this movie. So uh, I kind of did it in reverse order. Um, but that, but that was the sort of earliest memories. I'm curious, wait, what are some of your, what, because you're also interested in the genre. Did you grow up seeing scary movies or was it like a later? I'm always interested in how people find their love of. Oh, yeah. Um, for me, that's, wow, that's so fascinating. So, I know what you did last summer. Very important movie. Along with, I still know what you did last summer. <laughs> so, that film for me was really visceral in the slasher realm and really haunted me for a long time, really. Um, that imagery of a darkly cloaked figure. Um, who has the capacity to take life in one instance, and he's it. it it's not even really a, a gender at, at the end of the day. comes down to being a force that's like outside of this world, and that was freaky to me. Um, it's amazing you're talking about the, the fate, like the identity that you don't see. These seem like maybe like silly references, but it's amazing like if you backtrack from them, even the, you know, I'm thinking of that, I think it's a French movie, Eyes Without a Face. And there's something that seems almost, and Stephen Young's character talks about this in the dreams he's having, but like there seems to be some things that we find like so primal in our, in terms of the uncanny or the things that we don't know why we find these things disturbing or, you know, dolls coming to life. I mean, Freud wrote about this, but it's like, you can make fun of the Chucky franchise, but there's there's a reason why Twilight Zone episodes, you know, mannequins and and these inanimate objects coming to life is more disturbing than sometimes a werewolf or a creature of. But yeah, that you're you're getting me thinking to just how much that the face that you just can't quite make out or the identity that has so much power over you, uh, how interesting that is. And even Wes Craven's Scream, I mean, the mask is part of what I think makes it so. The unflinching, unwavering, you know, it's almost like, you know, harkens back to Greek drama. Well, and moving there to the setting and the duality of it too, the setting of New York, but also the specific setting of the space and that haunted nature of it. It's interesting. I find pre-war architecture and spaces with history, like when you're about to move into a space and you see it naked uh, or you leave, if you have you ever had the last look on moving day where you actually see the dust bunnies and the cable wire that you almost forgot, the things that were behind your television. Or, um, And I guess haunting feels like too dramatic a word, but I've always found like what the emptiness implies in terms of the cracks in the molding, the f- amount of families or people who've come before you, why the floor is... Uh, tilted, just the history of the space itself, the foundation is even, you know, in, in a lot of these tenements that I lived in, the, the, they're literally leaning. And so I guess I'm really drawn to history and how the camera can hold so much story in, or how space can tell such a story based on its existence. And I don't know, there's something very comforting to me about even though the space is very haunted, that that where the story unfolds, I do find pre-war architecture kind of comforting. So as warped as it might seem, I'm also, I find it, for as dingy and drab and depressing as it is, I also find it quite, I find myself more at home in a space that has been lived in and inhabited than a new shiny 
like I saw Candyman and a lot of those opening scenes and those really sleek, you know, and I'm like, uh, that implies a different kind of horror to me, that kind of erasure of, you know, what was there in this, these glassy boxes. And then from a set design perspective, knowing that obviously the play is written different medium and you took that to a produced script or a produced version how did you have to change um, your thought process and how you were utilizing the space um, to evoke those emotions? Uh, it, it was somewhat organic in that I just was thinking of it as a movie. And I think what that means is you start to just, uh, uh, if you're doing your job as a screenwriter, which is how, you know, my path to director started with creating a screenplay that was so, did all the things you're not supposed to do. It was so obsessed with mise-en-scene and where the camera was, and what, where, how things should be. That by the time I finished, I sort of had accompanying, um, like sort of a visual Bible that went with it, with 200 images and stills, more for myself. And as I was, because it was, I knew that, I just felt like I saw it. And as many of you guys probably know, what that means is you're likely to either get a chance to direct it or you'll be asked to exit the project <laughs> once you're finished, if with that kind of specificity. So it was a risk that ended up paying off. But what it meant when I was dealing with production design and pre-production is a lot of incredible conversations with the production designer about Kislowski, the filmmaker who had made a lot of movies I was obsessed with because they're very good at sort of tapping the ordinary and the everyday with something, some sense of like the numinous or something bigger. He, in a lot of the Three Colors trilogy, he's very, he's very close and he's very wide. And I thought something about that felt really important for this movie. The apartment really is a character. This is how it's going to be filmed. And that dictates a level of maybe attention to the production design that I found really, really exciting. I want to jump over to your characters. They all feel so distinct and lived in, but everyone's carrying a bit of pain, it seems, a bit of um, trauma. Where did you find yourself pulling from to bring those characters to life? You know, in this case, I really was putting a lot of the things that were keeping me up at night and people I loved up at night into these uh, specific characters. I was thinking about the start of a book, uh, an epigraph that made me laugh out loud that was like uh, an old self-help book called Think and Grow Rich that had something that I found... Do you ever find something like a little profound in a something that you're making fun of? And so the, the epigraph was like, there are six fears that every human being has and goes through. And it was something like, I think the breakdown was like a fear of ill health, fear of criticism, fear of loss of love. And it's a little funny, but I did build the play and the film a little bit like a one of those thrillers where like, you know, you discover that each one is holding a, they, a lot of them have multiple, but like there is one that is suffering from a health condition. There is one that is very much meditating on having lost her partner of eight years. I miss her. Hey, listen. You'll find someone new. Hey, I'm serious. You're going to find someone. Not with history. Carol knew me with acne. She, she helped me with my law school I, you're, application. You're, you're going to come out of this stronger. I just stop, I just stop lying to me. Just stop. Um, anyone who's gone through a breakup probably knows what that strange space is like. Uh, fear of poverty is drip. I think money anxiety is dripping throughout the play. As an artist who started out as a playwright with a day job for a decade, it's... I don't have to explain to you where like money uh, anxiety comes from, but I was surprised at how much the financial anxiety extended to the entire family, and that, that was a bit unexpected. I remember f the first time it, it was in front of an audience and people bringing up the term money, and I was like, why is everyone talking about money? I didn't write a play about money, and I certainly didn't make a film about money, and then you watch it after you hear people say that and you realize that there's almost not two minutes that go by that somehow finances are not like just bubbling up, you know, without people even trying. I just feel like you have this 
amazing capacity to hold tension and escalate it in such a gradual manner. Yeah, I mean, I was interested in this kind of undercover thriller aspect of it where it's not important that anyone watching the film even know that it's happening, but it's embedded from the opening moments, even in the terms of the way things are shot. Everything is sort of all these familiar things that you've seen in family dramas. Oftentimes, even when you're not processing it, something is very consciously a little off. And I think the mind, the body just absorbs that information differently. And so I think the idea of how you almost build a real house before you can haunt it, or the idea that you really mind the uncanny and get at the truest dread by not starting with like a vampire, but having the patience to sort of lay the groundwork for something um, where you don't, you almost don't know why that like sort of knot in your stomach is, is tightening. Uh, my experience with the film is people don't know why they're getting scared. And I love that. You know, the music for the humans is very strange, very much comes from the apartment, and it's a very quiet movie, which is also why I think people, it, like a reminder how uncomfortable people are with silence. But I find the opposite, that the, the sort of pointing towards the sort of stings and the violin that tells you something is about to come is so indicating, is indicating way too hard. It's too indicative of the thing that's about to come and so untrusting of audiences that I think audiences... Sometimes I think it's great when people are processing something. And I think it's, we live in a culture where a thing is done and people are like, what did you think about it? And my favorite films are the films I can watch four times. It, I think like, the more I watch it, the more I'm like, oh yeah, it also is like very quietly a foreign film about an American family. Like it has that feel. It's not a foreign film, but it has like a feel that I think I think something about it feels unfamiliar and unsettling that maybe is hard to talk about because that's maybe an aspect of it too. Like the family feels very traditional. Like, you know, this purple state family from Northeast PA, the movie, the structure, the, the thing that's holding it doesn't feel like the thing that you expect to hold it. And so I think that contributes a little bit to the tension too. The opening of the film I find so fascinating because of the imagery, at least, that I read um, personally through it. It seemed like there were some hints to religion, how you just frame the buildings as you curve through the camera shots. There's the obvious just example of being at the bottom of um, these buildings and just the darkness that you can see veering upwards. Um, so that idea of almost feeling in a hole, feeling trapped in a way. What was some of the impetus behind that for you to really ground the audience at the jump in sort of that mindset, I guess? Yeah, to bring it up to Freud and the Uncanny. I just had this idea to try to be, I wanted to be very simple, but also have something that felt iconic and signal what the movie was going to be. Because I love the way that like just bodies absorb information without... Like, I think an audience doesn't have to articulate. They can just have a feeling, have a connection, and it doesn't have to be result in an essay. And so I love these buildings in my neighborhood. I've lived in these buildings my entire time in New York City. And I was always fascinated by before the laws were changed so that there had to be a significant distance between tenements. You know, the air shafts sort of existed to provide that, but have since been deemed, you know, not sufficient. But again, I thought um, these buildings that are photographed all the times in movies and are very familiar to everyone, what about just showing these architecture, these familiar spaces in, in an unfamiliar light, looking at the sky shapes from below. And I was astonished when I took my iPhone around to as many, I got into about over the summer, about 20 garbage air shafts including the building that I lived in, of course. But I was amazed that just with your, you know, and I guess the iPhone that I had at the time is probably like approximating like a, an 18 millimeter sort of focal length. And I couldn't believe how gorgeous it was. And I, for your first movie especially, like that's really, really invigorating to have that control now. You get in these lanes as artists. I was like, well, I guess I'm a playwright. I always wanted to direct 
And then you get a little older and you're like, well, I haven't been in film school. Like, I guess I missed this boat or I guess I missed this. Of course, the more experience I had on film sets, just being a writer and experience working with directors, you are getting these masterclasses. The things that feel like special effects in the humans are not special effects. Like when we went in the beer bottle, they were basically like, well, we can't just do that going in. Then I was like, no, what if we literally get on this really super squishy like lens and we just... We just go, they're just like, well, we'll see, but it's going to end up looking. And it did things and no one expected the Christmas lights through a beer bottle to do what they did. I won't, I won't spoil it for anyone who hasn't seen it, but it just does the most extraordinary things. I read somewhere there was a discourse about this film and the play in some form starting a conversation about post 9-11 and sort of this idea of this terror haunting tied to that experience, not only obviously for the city of New York, our country, but also these specific characters within the play and the uh, the film. Can you talk a little bit about that? And was that a conscious choice? Is that a read that audiences are pulling in? Yeah, it was conscious in that in the stew of fear and anxiety that I was trying to process or make sense of or just hold. I was someone who moved to New York right after 9-11. And so what I was, I would say, more interested in just observing was the thing that felt impossible to describe for obvious reasons, which was that how do you reflect on just the word terror had become co-opted or used both because we were we were fighting wars on terror. I was more just curious about the feeling of a city in the aftermath of something that was almost impossible to process because it's so unthinkable. And then the genesis of the actual story, though, was still holding on to that tension post 9-11, but in the wake of the financial crisis. Because for where I was in my day job working at a law firm, I was more just intrigued at a city that seemed like it had barely gotten a foot out of trying to rebuild or heal and, you know, I was really just interested in the insane anxiety that erupted both in the midst of watching all the higher ups. It was sort of a, a crazy look at people who were scared for all different sorts of reasons. And so it, it doesn't just permeate the air. I feel like it, it sort of sits in, in the story in a specific way, but also in a way that is mostly not talked about for that reason. It's just sort of part of the history. Through that, terror in the sort of creative or literary device idea versus horror, two completely separate things, which some people don't realize. But I'm curious for you, both ideas were sort of ruminating around as you were de- developing the script. Why did you ultimately stick with terror and that sort of haunting as the basis as opposed to going all, all the way with it? I think I've just always been most scared about the things that I can't quite see, shadows in the dark, and I've always paid really close attention to it. I've always been the person who's obsessed with Rosemary's Baby and then and loves the movie, full stop. But the least interesting part to me is the demon baby, like the actual visual sight of the creature. I always sort of ruins it for me, because maybe because my own imagination is more uh, twisted than any, any CGI monster. For me, it was mostly just writing towards what the kind of movie I wanted to see and the kind of the things that sort of scared me the most. You have characters that are everyday sort of characters, um, middle class family, and at the same time, they have moments where they're speaking about just regular difficulties or uh, disagreements, yet it can sound so lyrical, even though it's everyday language. How did you develop that voice? My path as a writer was often, and as a film director, I would say it's often about falling more and more in love with economy as a guide, like realizing how much I get out of stripping away. And so I become a little obsessive and interested in things like the actress who plays the mother of this family, Jane Howdy Shell. There's sort of like uh, her at a table in front of some ranch dip talking becomes like an aria to me. Ah, oh, I'm back on Weight Watchers. That's great, Mom. Oh, thanks, yeah. Oh. It's tough. <laughs> One baby ice cream cone takes up half my points for the day. Yeah. 
same for a junior cheeseburger from Wendy's. <laughs> Tough staying on track. Yeah. Especially when you eat a bucket of ranch dip before dinner. It's the last side dish, yeah? We're not being careful about points today. Nope. Not on holidays. In moments like that, it becomes a little bit conscious. You almost see this what you're getting out of this ordinary moment. But the merger of that, my love of doing that with language, with the ability to also hold her in a close-up um, and divert your attention to only her and say, don't look away from this woman. Those moments and experiences felt like that merger of writing and directing is so exhilarating to me. And what sort of affordances or opportunities did it put on the table? As you mentioned, you were looking to like make this story in a new light in this uh, different medium. A third of the dialogue was gone, which I would say, being the playwright, you think I'd be most like protective of all of those lines. And that was the biggest surprise to me. And then once we were filming, I realized how much even less I could say, because of course you, you fall in love with you know, uh, Beanie Feldstein and Stephen Young's relationship is so much in the film about how they interact with each other. There's this comic book called Quasar that I was obsessed with as a kid. Uh, you're it's about... still obsessed with Quasar. Okay, well, I am. <laughs> Be quiet. Um, <laughs> it's about this species of like half alien, half demon creatures with teeth on their backs. Oh my God, just call and them monsters. In their, in, on, on their planet, they like the, the scary stories that they tell each other are all about us. The horror stories for the monsters are about humans. Thank God he's I love them. Well, people are, you should meet my boss. No teeth on his back, but man. I really love that the way a couple interacts, how much story is in what you as an audience, if I played 15 seconds of them in the movie, I could push stop and say, you know, what do you think you know about these people? And it's astonishing, like, at how much you can intuit based on their sense of humor with each other, the way they're a little... He must might be the people pleaser. She's the one that is a bit of a steamroller. i got to watch out for her. So just all of those things, you know. And then thinking in images, it's just... It becomes a really fun way to do the thing that I really like to do, which is, like, what is the thing that is the thing, and how do you get everything else out of the way? On Story is brought to you in part by the Alice Kleberg Reynolds Foundation, a Texas family providing innovative funding since 1979. This podcast is presented by Too Far Media, provocative stories for the eyes, ears, and imagination by Rich Shapiro. Also by Final Draft, industry standard screenwriting software. Find out more information about Final Draft at finaldraft.com and by the Bogle Family Vineyards, sixth-generation farmers, and third-generation winemakers based in Clarksburg, California. Makers of sustainably grown wines that are a reflection of their family values since 1968. This project is supported in part by the Cultural Arts Division of the City of Austin Economic Development Department, the Texas Commission on the Arts, and the National Endowment for the Arts on the web at arts.gov. Our associate producers are Jamal Knox and Colin Heyer. Editing help from Travis Neely and Travis Kennedy Sound. Music by Brian Ramos. Production assistance comes from the Sound Lab Inc., Travis Kennedy Sound, and KUT 90.5 in Austin. Go to austinfilmfestival.com to find out more about the Austin Film Festival and Conference each October. Until next time, I'm Barbara Morgan, and this has been Austin Film Festival's On Story. <laughs>